I have uh, multiple uh, devices in my, in my uh, briefcase with me today. Now, how many of you feel sometimes like you're like this, uh, where you have, like, how many people need both hands to count all your devices? So some, wow, okay. So only a handful of people need two hands to count their devices. Do you need more than two hands, like two hands and two feet? I, I, I don't have quite this many at home, but I have a drawer full of devices that we use for, that we use for testing. Mobile, and, and not all these are, are mobile, but I have at least four tablets and I have at least uh, four different phones that I use fairly regularly for testing, for playing with, for trying new things. And when I see new shiny things come out, I want them. So, um, and, and, and this is the beauty of being in an accessibility, uh, in the accessibility field. You, this is being broadcast, right? Is it, is, is, so, <laughs> these are all useful for accessibility testing. So if you want one, go and get one. Whatever comes out that's new, if you want it, go and get it for accessibility testing. All in the name of accessibility testing. We, we get seduced by devices all the time. I get seduced by devices. They're, they're very uh, useful and, and we, we get excited about them. They're fun, they're creative, they feel, they feel interesting and cool. There's new features, there's always things that are, that are in the mobile space, whether it be a, full on, a phone or a, a larger tablet or a mini tablet. They're, they're, they're things that are just very exciting. We want to try and build on that excitement as much as possible. I, I wanna talk to you today about this idea of crossing over and bringing things that are innovative in the mobile space or things that are making us think differently about mobile and how that can start to work its way into accessibility. We often, oh sorry, so yeah, this is, this is me. I'm Derek Featherstone. You can email me, feather at simplyaccessible.com or I'm feather on Twitter if you're, if you're tweeting. Um, feel free to, uh, to shout out to me. Um, I'm not wearing my jacket today, but I mostly look like that all the time. Just standing there. You see? You see the. So, I want to talk to you about this idea of of crossing over and and bringing mobile uh, innovation or or mobile thinking to accessibility. This is uh, Archimedes, and Archimedes is widely known. And there's this story about Archimedes that that he was in the bathtub. Uh, or as he sank into the bathtub, as he was uh, sitting down for a bath, he had this brilliant idea. He was faced with the problem of determining whether or not the king's crown was actually made of pure gold or whether the goldsmith had actually put some silver in there as well. And he was, he was tasked with, with figuring out how to determine whether or not the, uh, the material was pure gold in this crown. So he was playing with different ideas and one of the... the stories that is always told is that as he sat down in the bathtub to take a bath, he saw the water rise and he came up with this idea that the amount of the, the distance that the water rose was directly related to the amount of material that was going down into the water, right? It makes, it makes perfect sense. And he is reported to have jumped up out of the bathtub and streaked, literally streaked naked into the streets, streets yelling out, Eureka! Right, Eureka, I've found it. I've figured out the way that we are going to do this. And, and this, this story is, is romanticized and, and, and spoken about like he had this sudden epiphany and that it was this one moment of him sitting down in the bathtub where he suddenly realized what it was that was, uh, was going to solve this problem for him. And this story is is just that, it's a story, and it's useful for, for people to think about as a, as a frame of reference, but a lot of people look back in the history books and they say, well, well, that wasn't just this one singular moment, right? There was a lot of things that he went through first in order to get to that one moment. And, and I love this, this is, uh, it's a really interesting book, it's called uh, The Myths of Innovation by Scott Birkin. If you haven't read it, it's really, it's really quite interesting. He talks about the, the process of of innovation and this idea that we have that innovation is this, this static moment in time where there's this one thing that happens and all of a sudden you've got this, this uh, miracle epiphany. And one of the things that he, he talks about is this, this idea that for most there really is no singular magic moment where this stuff happens. It's just these small insights that accumulate over time and, and build up. 
And I think that's a, a useful way to think about innovation, not just in terms of, of any technology, but what we're doing in accessibility. We're, we're looking at these small pieces of insights that we've built up over many, many years of experience that lead to this one singular thing that may appear to be an epiphany, but really isn't. It's built up over time. And I love this. This is another quote, <coughs> excuse me, another quote from, uh, from his book. Somebody that's an innovator might ask questions like, what else in the world is like this, right? Who else has solved a problem similar to mine already? Where can I look for inspiration to, to see other ways that people have solved these problems, right? And, and an innovator will look at the entire world and try to find related issues. Uh, an example, and, and I try to think about this in, in terms of um, accessibility all the time. We're doing a lot of things in the digital space, but the problems that we're trying to solve in the digital space are already solved in many ways out in the real world, right? Out in the physical, in physical space. Uh, when, you, when you look at, uh, in any major city, you'll see uh, tactile ground surface indicators for people that can't see, right? There'll be, there'll be bumps in the pavement or ridges in the pavement, or there'll be uh, actual things that are bolted in, into, into the, the sidewalk so that people that have, say, a, a you know, a, a, if they're blind and they're using a cane, they can feel those, those ground surface indicators so that they know where, that they're at the edge of the road, right? Or they may be um, something that it's in the, in the metro, in the subway, and so there's ground surface indicators to say, hey, you're getting close to, uh, close to the platform or you're getting close to the exit. And those things work in the real world because they provide contrast, right? If those ground surface indicators were everywhere, then they would be absolutely useless but they work in those settings because they're not everywhere. They're a, they're a contrast. And so in the web world, we do things like put headings on our page. If every single piece of text that we had on a page was a heading, it would be kind of useless, right? Headings only work because of contrast. When everything's a heading, nothing is a heading. So we need to have heading, regular text, headings, regular text. So we look, I like to look for solutions in the real world, in the physical sense, that have already existed for years and try to find ways that we can bring those into the things that we do in the web. And you think about really, really simple technology like the keyboard that everybody has on their laptop or, or uh, on... Uh, you know, just on their, on their desktop computer. The keyboard is like every other innovation. It's a combination of a whole bunch of things that came before it. All the technology, all the science that goes into making a keyboard existed long before the keyboard was ever, was ever created, right? That was already in existence, but we're combining those new idea, those ideas in novel and new ways. Uh, and, and so all of those things, even though they, they existed in different senses or in, in different areas, we bring those new ideas together and we create something new from them. And that's, that's really a, a useful way, I think, to frame innovation, right? Those are the kinds of things that we need to be looking at. So what are other people doing? How can we bring those things into, into our work? And so what I want to do uh, is, is start to look at different types of innovation and different things that are happening in not just in the mobile space, but also things that are happening in the way that we design for desktop sites that are influenced by uh, the mobile space. Now, how many of you know what a, a turducken is? A few people. So this is, and I thought this would happen. So a turducken is a, a US, uh, it was apparently invented in the US. However, there are rumors that it actually started in French Canada. And I'm not making this up. So a turducken uh, is something that has a level of, of difficult, and I'll explain to you what it is in a moment. It's, I looked to see if I could find a translation for turducken, and there isn't a French translation for it. So it's actually un canard à l'intérieur d'un poulet à l'intérieur d'une dinde. The turkey, a chicken, and a duck. And they stuff the duck inside the turkey, no, they stuff the duck inside the chicken and then they stuff that chicken inside the turkey. And that creates a turducken. So that's your new uh, non-French word for the day. Uh, I don't know if we could shorten this to anything uh, that would fit. And I don't know. I, if, if one of you can shorten this into a short form for that, uh, you might call it something else. I have no idea what. But um, So it's, it's this... Deboned, I'm, I promise you I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> 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 
And we take these new, we, these things, a, a turkey, a chicken, and a duck, and we put them together in new combination, <laughs> innovative ways. Um, and then you add new layers of complexity on it by adding bacon. And we have a tur... I, I apologize for any vegetarians in the room. This is a turbacon duckin, which is un canard à l'intérieur de poulet à l'intérieur d'une dinde enveloppée de bacon. How's my French? Is that okay? No, I, I couldn't make this up. I, had, I can read that no problem and pronounce it reasonably well, but I couldn't make this up on my own. So we have these, these ideas that we find and we think, and some people come up with the bright idea all the time. If something is good, just add bacon to it and that will make it better, right? That counts, that's innovate. In some ways that's innovation, maybe not in every way, but. So these are the kinds of things that we, that we want to think about. We want to think about taking these different ideas and bringing them together to create something new. Now, I, I truly believe that we need to look for inspiration everywhere. And, and um, in, in honor of Adam as the only person with a Blackberry in the room, um, I thought I would show an example from BlackBerry, and I think this is actually a really interesting idea. <clears throat> In the mobile space, the, the, mobile opera, the operating system on BlackBerry has an accessibility setting that allows you to specify the grid layout that the icons on the home screen use. Now, it's normally uh, you know, four, four icons uh, across and then a, a whole list of them that, that move down, but what they, what they have the ability to do is say, I want to have one column or two columns or three or four. And what this ends, what, <coughs> excuse me, what we end up doing is saying, well, if I'm in two columns, what, I, what we do is we still have that same icon, but we create a much larger hit area. So this is something that, that somebody with dexterity impairment may use, right? Somebody that needs a larger hit area because they don't have the fine motor control to hit that smaller, smaller icon, right? So you can envision this with, one icon as the whole screen, essentially, and then move down to get to the next icon and move down to the next icon, or in a two, in a, a two column layout, or a three column layout, or a four column layout. And I think this is actually a really interesting feature. I don't like the fact that the, the icons themselves are so small within the hit area. Uh, for other people, they may need to actually make those icons larger, right? Um, but, but that's a different problem. That's usually a vision problem. This is a, a motor control problem that we're trying to solve by creating that larger hit area, right? So there's some, there's some interesting things for innovation in here, and we can look at this and say, well, what is it, what could we do with our websites to make them configurable like that, right? We do things with different style sheets, but, but not just different style sheets and different ways of looking at things. What if we could do something where we say, and we do this responsively right now, right? We go, we'll create a responsive design where we have a three column layout. And then we, you know, as the user, no user ever does this, but they take the bottom corner of their browser and they shrink it down. We go from three columns to two columns to one column, right? We do that responsively now, but there's no reason that we couldn't do something like this where we provide those options in a preference or something like that, right? We could easily do some of this stuff in our, um, in, in, in our settings, in our preferences within a web app or a website that we're creating. I mean, there's no reason that we couldn't do this. This is another interesting thing, and I find this, this one really uh, kind of fascinating. Uh, there's, a, there's a touch screen fridge that exists out there, and the, the entire, there's a lot of touch screen fridges now, refrigerators, that are, that are being built for kitchens. And one of the problems with the touchscreen fridges is they don't make the entire surface a touchscreen. They just make this one portion a touchscreen. And that means in order to use the touchscreen, you need to be able to see the touchscreen, which is really not very flexible, right? They have to try and place it in the optimum spot for everybody to be able to see. Well, I know that my eight-year-old son would not be able to look at the same screen level as me, right? I'm standing in front of the fridge. My, eyes, my eye level is here. If I'm going to interact with that one, it's probably fine. But my son, maybe I don't want him, maybe I don't want him manipulating the fridge through the touch screen anyway. But if, if there was something that he needed to do on the touch screen, he's eight years old, he's only about this tall, that touch screen that's up here is useless to him. So one of the, the uh, innovations in, the, in this refrigerator industry, sounds weird to say that, but 
in the appliance industry with a refrigerator is actually making the touch screen show up where the person first touches the, the fridge. So if I'm here and I touch the fridge here, the touch screen comes up for me at that level. But for my son, he's down here. If he touches it down here, the touch screen is down there for him. Right, so it's a relative. The touch screen positions itself relative to the first touch. And I immediately thought of that when I thought of this dialer. This is an Android, an accessible Android dialer. The middle button on a phone, right, on, a, on an old school touch, touch uh, push button phone, the middle button is the five. And so what they did in this scenario for this accessible dialer, for people that can't see, the five always shows up on the screen wherever you first touch. So if I touch, if I have my, I don't have my phone. If I touch here, five is where my finger is. If I touch here, five is where my finger is. If I touch in the middle, five is where my finger is. In order to dial, what I then do is I touch the screen and then if I wanna dial a, a five, I just let go. If I wanna dial a two, I will push, get the five, and then move up, right? So to dial a nine, what would you do? Touch the screen, move down and over, you'll hear the nine, and you let go. And so what it does is it creates this, this uh, relatively positioned touchpad that allows you to, to dial, and it doesn't matter where you first touch, right? One of the problems that people that can't see the, that screen have is they don't know where the icons are. So we had to come up with all these mechanisms for them to find the icons. Right, well, what if we just bring the buttons to you instead of you having to find the buttons? So that's the, the you know, this is, and this is specific to, uh, to the Android operating system. But what could we do in the web space to do something like this that always creates a relative menu that's there when you need it? Right? Not necessarily from a visual perspective, but let's say I'm working within a web page. Maybe we could have some kind of a, you know, something that we built into our web app that has, <coughs> excuse me, that has a particular keystroke shortcut or some particular gesture that we use that brings up the menu of all the things that you can do on that site or with that particular application right then and there. Right? And so looking at these other these other uh, applications of this technology, how can we use that to, to maybe influence our thinking? Now, it may be that a relative menu for an application is a bad idea or it doesn't work well, but we need to explore some of those things and say, well, maybe this is a possibility. Maybe this is something that we, that we should do. Um, and this is, this is not mobile, but I love this. This is a, a modular gaming controller for people that can only use one hand. So you see here, just in this uh, bottom module here, the, the module that has all the different symbols on it. This is a gaming controller for a, a Sony PlayStation. Right? And each one of the, the joysticks and the triggers and the other directional pads, each one of those things is modular, so you can change the way that this thing is set up. There's some really, really cool th other features in here as well. If you look at the bottom, you'll see there's a slight concave surface. Somebody that is using a controller, if we're using two hands, we usually grab the controller like that and we can use our thumbs and use our, our fingers to, to pull the triggers and press the buttons. For somebody that only has one hand or the ability to use one hand, that becomes really challenging to hold a controller. So what they have done is they've taken this and they flattened it and put a concave surface on the bottom so that the controller can rest on their knee. Right? Now they have a stable surface that they can use to manipulate that controller. It's completely modular, so you can set it up this way. If you're uh, left-handed, if you're a single-handed player and you're left-handed, you can set it up differently if you're right-handed. <clears throat> so we look at these kind of things, and, and I look at this, and I think this is brilliant engineering, brilliant design to be able to do something like this. Could we do something where we, we allow right, the, the user to configure the modules of your website, to put them in the order that they want things to be in? Right? Maybe it's your website or it's an application and there's particular pieces of functionality. What if somebody wants the navigation first? There's been lots of debate about this over time, right? I want navigation first and some people want the content first and they want the navigation at the end. Right? Something simple like that, a, a simple decision. What if we could build something so that each person could choose? 
I want my navigation first or I want my content first. Why, why can't we do that? There's no reason we can't do that. So these are some of the things that I, that I think, you know, we can start to look at the world around us and see what else is happening and, and start to look at those things and how they might influence what we do on the web, whether it be uh, on the mobile, in terms of mobile interface design or desktop design, whatever it is. Uh, and, and a lot of these things can help uh, accessibility. How many of you are familiar with Luke Rabluski's book, Mobile First? It's a, it's a great book. There's a lot of really interesting things in here. And one of the things that he, he, he uh, proposes is that we start to think of mobile first. And, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that thinking mobile first does is it helps you to simplify. It helps you to think of what are the most important things that this person needs to do right now. And when we think about that, that helps simplify interfaces for everybody. There's, there's, a, lot of, um, there's a lot of interplay. Um, we talk about assistive technologies. We talk about things that are, that are on my iPhone right now. I have voice recognition software. I have autocorrect. I have predictive text typing. I have lots of different features in here that were originally invented for people with disabilities. The reality of it is that we talk about the crossover between uh, accessibility and, mo and mobile design, like there's all these things that we've been doing for years and years and years for people with disabilities that we're now seeing come to fruition in, in mobile devices. If there's such great interplay between the two, why aren't we doing it the other way? Right? What can we as accessibility people learn from the innovation that's happening in the mobile space? And I think that's part of what, what we're looking for today is, is looking at what's happening in the mobile space and, and latch on to that. People are, if you, I, we're all here as accessibility people, right? People that have an interest in accessibility. There's a lot of people beyond these walls that just don't have an interest. But I bet you if you start talking to people in your organizations about mobile design, they'll be way more excited than they are about accessibility, right? So one of the things that I think we should do as much as possible is dig in and start embracing the things that are in, mobile, in the mobile space and use those to influence what we do in accessibility. And there may just be some innovations in the mobile space that we haven't even thought of applying to accessibility yet. So maybe we should be looking there and starting to pull some of those things in. Now, <coughs> one of... <coughs> One of the things that one of the things that that mobile design does, or designing for mobile, helps us do, is start to think about how things are being used, right? What is the context of the person? Because we're always trying to think, what can I give to this person on their mobile device right now that's going to be really useful for them, right? What what you know what? Where are they? What location are they at? What are they near? Um, what are the device capabilities? What are they thinking about? What, what are we doing for design in the mobile space and how does that define what we design in terms of thinking about context? So all of these things, time, location, proximity, these are all things that people have thought about for years, but they're getting a lot of airtime right now in the mobile world. So how do we take those things and then use them for accessibility? One of the things that I, I think defines context is, is the, the issue of time. So we, you, you heard in my introduction that I was I'm part of the UX Camp team, Ottawa, UX Camp Ottawa. And one of the things that we did in, in 2011 was really focus on creating something that worked really well on, on mobile devices. So we, we looked at these mobile devices and said, well, let's create something that works really well in that scenario. So we have it, it's a responsive design, it fits in the right space. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's flexible, it fits the containers in which it, it uh, is, is contained. So we have, this is just a simple example of the header. Uh, we had a, a schedule that was very responsive as well. So it fits well in, the, in, the mobile, uh, in a mobile view. That's on the iPhone, it worked just as well on the, on the Android. And we started to look at this and we were, we were creating this schedule uh, with this particular design for a very specific reason. Right. We looked at it and said, on the day of the event, the most important, we're trying to get into context, right? The most important content on that day is the schedule. All the stuff about registering doesn't matter anymore, right? It just doesn't matter because you're already here, 
right? You're already at the event. The only thing that matters is the schedule. When you're there, it's the schedule. That's it. So we started to think, and it wasn't just the schedule. We thought of a, a few other things. But the schedule was the most important thing. Uh, the social sharing things, an activity that we wanted to encourage, was sort of the second most important thing. We also wanted to recognize the sponsors, but they took a different role. Right? They took on a different role. They were in the, in the footer. And then we looked at this and said, well, let's not just make it so that the schedule page looks like this. Let's make it so that on the day of the event, the entire site becomes this. So you go to uxcampottawa.org on any device, not just your mobile phone, on your desktop, on your tablet, on whatever it is, it gets this design. Because the schedule is the only thing that matters that day. Right. It started out as being something that we were thinking was all about mobile and making it accessible, of course. It's easier to find the information that people need. But the schedule is the only thing that matters on that day. And just in case there's something in the other parts of the site that people need, we had this link back to the full site. That makes sense, right? We look at this and say, well, yeah, of course, right? The importance of information over time changes. So photos are really not important before the event, but after the event, they are important. During the event, they're important. Speaker information, somewhat important as you're trying to sell the conference, not as important on the day of, and maybe more important afterwards so that people want to reach out and contact those speakers. Right? The schedule, not, not important at the beginning, really not important. But as we get closer to the event, and on the day of the event, really very much important. After the event, kind of irrelevant. Selling, registration, before the event, really important. After the event, nothing. The, the importance of information changes over time. Now, that's a really simple example, but we looked at that a little, another step, took it another step further and said, what can we do with location? And, and location and geolocation is something that we're thinking about all the time on mobile. Everybody's looking at it and saying, what can we do with geolocation? We looked at this and said, instead of getting the schedule, if you're more than, you know, if it's, if it's the, morning of the, day, uh, the morning of the event and you're more than X distance away, then we're not going to give you the schedule by default. We're going to give you the directions on how to get there because we've geolocated you you're away from, away from the conference venue. When you're within the conference venue, we're not gonna give you the directions on how to get there. We're going to give you the stuff about the things that are happening in the building, right? Geolocation is kind of funny because we have these, these really ugly, um, these ugly dialogue boxes that say, you know, do you want me to allow, uh, do you want to allow me to use your location? And the answer most of the time is no, I don't want you to. Um, so I think we need to do improve something here. But this is, this is a way that we use geolocation to basically say, um, let's create a better design and create something that everybody benefits from. Right? Somebody that's using a screen reader or is using a mobile device or is using whatever technology, if we give them the right information up front, there's less interaction that needs to happen because we're just giving them the stuff that they need, right? Making something easier for everyone to use also makes it more accessible and more simple to use. So we, we have all these other, other questions about location. I won't go into each one, but they're, they're all related to where you actually are. And we can geolocate people and find out where they are, they are and then we can even change the information in terms of its priority and say, well, if you're um, in the city of Ottawa, if you're right inside the building, you need different information than if you're within a block, than if you're within the city or even farther away. Right? If, you're, if you're in Montreal and you're looking up the UX Camp Ottawa site, you're farther away, you need potentially information, more information on how to get there, right? Where's the airport? How do I get there? Do I get, need a car rental? If I'm coming from out of town, maybe I need a hotel. Whereas the people that are in the city don't necessarily need that information in the same priority. So what we, we talk about here is using geolocation to change the content priority within a page. We do this in mobile all the time. So how can we use that to improve accessibility on desktop sites, right? How could we use geolocation to make this map easier to use? This is a, a map 
that is uh, for a, a client of ours, Humana Healthcare in the US, and it's, a, it's an SVG map. And what it does is it allows people to choose their state and find out where the sales offices are um, for that particular state. Well, what can we do with geolocation to make that experience better? We can just geolocate them and say, here's the five offices that are closest to you, and if those don't work, go ahead and, and use the map to select. Right? And that can fail silently. So that if, we, if they say, no, I don't want to allow you to geolocate me, they can just turn that content off and have it not be there and just go straight to this. Right? We can use geolocation. We're doing it in mobile all the time. Why on earth aren't we doing it here? Right? We could do something where we geolocate somebody and, and this is a, all has a really well-defined tab order. Well, we could just go ahead and pre-select so that the first tab stop is the state that the person happens to be in. So we want to take a look at, at these kinds of things all the time uh, in terms of, of content. When we look at content like this, uh, we're sorting by price here on a, on a uh, listing of flights. So we're sorted by price, and we've got price right up at the top. If we sort by departure time, departure time is actually buried. And if we sort by shortest flight, the duration is actually buried even further into the listing. Well, why aren't we doing something where we're changing that so that the display is more in tune with what somebody has expressed an interest in? So if we look at somebody saying, I want departure time, that's an important thing to me. Why aren't we doing something where we're always leaving cost there, but why aren't we bringing departure time right up to the front so that people can find it easier, right? Using the things that people have given us. They say they want the shortest flight, well, let's bring the duration right up here as well. Right? Why aren't we doing those things with design? Part of it is because we're all pressed for time and, we, and developers are pressed for time and we just have to go, go, go. But these kinds of things are very prominent in mobile design right now. People are thinking about these kinds of things. Every single one of those rearrangements of content, right, bringing people the right content at the right time has a huge benefit for accessibility. We make everything easier to use. Right? We make it easier for people to find the information that they're, they're looking for. We need to get creative with this stuff. I'll give you one example, and I think this is, this is kind of a fun example, and then, and then I'm going to wrap here. Uh, and that's not going to work. Uh, where is it? Hang on. Oh, that... Yeah, that, this whole French keyboard really messing me up. What if we have something where we have a button and we're talking about uh, people with fine motor control issues? You know, we talk about having large hit areas. Well, what if somebody has fine motor control issues and they can't hit the button? Well, if we detect a miss, what if we do something like that? They missed the button. So let's just make, you could, I think there's a limit. We, we don't want to take over the whole page. But could we do something where we say, you've missed this button three times now. We're going to make your button bigger. Right? And there's, there's all kinds of crazy things that we could do where we're now saying, OK, well, now, and that's really ugly. But we've got a great big button now that is really easy to hit. Maybe we look at that and say, they were able to successfully hit this button. Let's make all the buttons on their site this size now. Let's adapt the design to them. Right, instead of making them adapt to us and to, and to the things that we create. So those are the kinds of things that we, that we talk about. Uh, I'll ask you to think about this. What, what are you going to do next? Right? What are you going to take from this? Uh, and I, I love this, this final quote from Scott's book. It's an achievement to find a great idea, but it's an even greater achievement to successfully use it to improve the world. Right? That's, that, to me, is what this kind of innovation is all about. And that's the kind of thing that we're doing every day. So please go out there, find some new things to do, and innovate and improve the world. Thank you.